Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, excellent presentation. Many, many thanks to, uh, to you. And uh, I think what we have heard uh, is uh, something remarkable. Uh, it is the shifting of minds, what we really need. When Stefan was speaking about the voter, we used to perceive voter, at least practitioners, as a source of challenges, source of problems that we have to sort out. Now he's talking about voter as a source of opportunities to drive future development. Thank you indeed. He's also suggesting the way how to move from theory to motion, to implementation. We need that. Thank you, Stefan. And uh, he's also calling our, uh, our attention to the necessity to move from reporting to making progress. These two are very, very different issues. And he's also suggesting to us to make the necessary corrections on the road. Uh, so I'd like to suggest now that we shift a little bit uh, uh, compared to the original plan. Uh, please reserve your remarks and questions to the end of the session. Uh, and now I'd like to call our uh, uh, second keynote speaker, who perhaps needs uh, not more, even less, uh, less introduction, uh, not less famous uh, than Stefan Wurmbrook. Uh, you may judge that to qualify into the closing panel, uh, a closing keynote panel of this conference, you, it's not enough to be an uh, outstanding scientist, but you also need to be uh, uh, Stefan. So I'd like to introduce to you Stefan Brinkitsu, uh, who is a professor of sustainable resource management and director of the Center of Environmental System Research at the University of Kassel, uh, where he heads the Sustainable Resource Futures uh, Group. He's a senior advisor at the Wuppertal uh, Institute of Climate, Environment, and Energy, and a member of the International Resource Panel. He's a corresponding member of the Academy of Spatial Science and Regional Planning, and he's uh, a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Industrial Ecology. His main research, research interests are the multi-scale analysis of the socio-industrial metabolism and related land use, the indicators of sustainability, analysis of drivers of uh, resource use, scenarios for sectoral and economy-wide sustainable resource management. So he is destined to be a champion of the implementation of the SDGs. Uh, the title of uh, his talk is Key Strategies to Achieve the SDGs and Consequences of Monitoring Resource Use. Just like in the previous case, I would like to throw to you some questions to you, Stefan, as well as, as to, uh, to the public. If you would like to think about or address to them, it would be uh, appreciated. How far are we from the safe operating space? How quickly we should decouple wealth generation from resource use? Are we on track or are we not? Your suggestions uh, for sustainable resource governance and how would you advance the monitor uh, the global resource use to meet the SDGs? Professor Bringitsu, the floor is yours. Your Excellency, dear Java, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here and thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation and the wonderful role to be here at the final plenary. Um, 20 uh, minutes, uh, it's kind of a challenge. Um, I will give you a short introduction on the system, um, systems perspective regard to the SDGs. You have heard already on that. Trends on uh, resource use in the world, key indicators future vision and key strategies, examples of resource efficiency and carbon recycling, and some conclusions, finally. Now, uh, we have heard about uh, the SDGs a lot, and one can group them into four groups. There are uh, 13, 14, and 15, which is about the conservation of Earth systems. Um, there is the other group, uh, supply of resource sectors, energy, water, um, and so on, 
And then we have the large group about social technological improvements of the economy, about economic growth, about infrastructure development. And fourth, uh, it's about health, education, and culture. And at least the, the three uh, first groups all are related to the use of natural resources and at least indirectly also the fourth group. Now, um, we have heard a lot about nexus. And when we are dealing with the big environmental pressures, uh, the global change of, of the climate, the land use change, the water issues, and the material resource flows, they are all driven by the economic activities of our societies, um, uh, with the consequence of interrelated impacts on the environment. When we have a more systematic uh, approach um, to, the, uh, to that picture I've just shown you, um, then we have uh, the production and consumption system in the center. This is our economy, our societies which take natural resources from the environment, minerals, fossil fuels, biomass, water, and release emissions and waste on the output side to the environment. And on both sides, on the extraction side and on the release side, there is a bundle of various environmental pressures. Uh, also within, say, the production and consumption system, we build up infrastructures, we are covering fertile soils with built-up uh, uh, installations. Uh, so also uh, the delta of the flows, the stocks change is also impacting the environment. Um, which means that um, the way how we induce those resource flows by our activities in production and consumption is key, is a key driver to all the environmental problems which we are facing. That means, in turn, that the SDG number 12, which is about sustainable production and consumption, is of central importance. In effect, it means if we do not have uh, effective uh, uh, means to sustain our uh, consumption of natural resources, we will not be able uh, to reach uh, the Paris goals and also uh, other uh, SDGs. Um, so in a historical perspective, uh, we observe that uh, if we take our uh, economy and society system as that system where we are uh, inducing our our wealth as well as uh, inducing pressure to environment, we started to control it from the back ends. We started with, uh, with uh, wastewater management at the end of the 19th century. In the 1960s, 70s, we had emission control, 1980s waste policies, at least in Germany. And in the 1990s, we started to discover that there is an inflow into that system and as long as we have a lot inflow into the system, it must, must come out sooner or later. Uh, so resource policy in the 1990s then uh, were triggered in order to enhance resource efficiency uh, with the logic that we should decouple wealth generation from resource consumption. So more than 20 years ago, meanwhile, it was uh, ideas of, of a factor four, factor 10, Factor X improvement, meaning a decoupling of economic growth and resource consumption. Meanwhile, we have quantitative targets in a, a, a variety of countries. Uh, we have uh, also policy programs, for instance, in Germany, in the sustainability strategy and in our pro, uh, pro, program for resource efficiency, the second phase. Also at the European uh, level, we have a resource strategy and a roadmap for resource efficiency. So in principle, something is ongoing. Now, what is the reality? This is a recent graph from the International Resource Panel. And we see that from 2003 onwards, the total extraction of used resources worldwide increased faster than world GDP. Now we are not on track with decoupling. We have a recoupling concern. So, and most of that, uh, admittedly, is due to the resource consumption of China. 
uh, which uh, increases quite heavily their uh, construction uh, stock of building and infrastructures. Um, but this is, in effect, a global picture. Um, uh, we also see that we have a, a growing number of environmental legal conflicts uh, about mining, about forestry, about waste disposal. Um, so it's not only, say, an imperial environmental issue, it's a social environmental issue. Here you see the picture of Germany, and we see a decoupling of uh, the gray line, which is the GDP, um, and the population, and the material footprint. The material footprint, uh, which accounts for the domestic as well as the foreign primary uh, raw materials uh, which we need for our consumption. So here we see a relative decoupling, indicating that there is some progress ongoing. And there's, one can explain that uh, uh, also theoretically and empirically, um, that uh, we start with the search for secure supply and then go for cost minimization, which lead to a resource or material efficiency in the in the uh, short range, and later on we are interested to secure supply on the long range, which leads us to sustainable supply of resources. Uh, and this sequence can also be discerned in the sequence of policy programs, starting with security of supply, going to foster resource efficiency, and now we are in search of how can we sustain the use of resources. Uh, we still see that a country like Germany uh, is a net importer uh, of materials. Uh, it has a footprint of 21 tons per person uh, each year. And now the question is, uh, which you put forward, is that are we within the threshold? No, we aren't. Uh, so we, here we see uh, the, the raw material consumption is the, is the material footprint. And it's 22 tons per capita. The world status is about nearly 11. And the target corridor would be between three and six, or a concrete number would be five. Uh, which means that the German consumption of materials is two times above uh, the average and four uh, times beyond the long-term sustainable level. Which means that the intrinsic mechanism, which I shortly mentioned, is not yet sufficient, and we need still continued and improved policies to uh, enter the uh, uh, sustainable corridor. Now, when it, we come to land use, we have two main trends. We have the expansion of the settlement area, and we have the expansion of the agriculture area, both going at the expense of natural forests, mainly in the tropical belt. And we did, uh, some years ago, I coordinated a study on global land use from the International Resource Panel, and we found that the net expansion until 2050 uh, would be between 120 and 500 million hectares for food supply, biofuel, and biomaterial supply, which is not compensated by increasing yields. Uh, and then a gross expansion of 320 to 850 million hectares. So that would be the total size of Brazil. Uh, when we account also for compensation of uh, built environment expansion and the compensation of soil degradation by erosion, for instance. So this is enormous. Um, so we see that uh, 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 Euro Europe, the European Union, uh, has a, a cropland footprint uh, of about uh, 0.29 hectare per person. Uh, whereas the, uh, the inland availability is about 0.24, and the sustainable uh, operating space uh, level would be around 0.20, which needs we would have to come down by nearly a third uh, in order to, to reach that, that corridor. And also with regard to the, um, the, the consumption of timber resources, so primary timber consumption is in Europe about uh, uh, oh point, uh, nearly, one, nearly one cubic meter per person. And it will strongly depend on the further implementation of policies. The point is that our renewable energy policies heavily depend on bioenergy. Now, the consequence of an increased use of primary use uh, of wood for energy purposes would strongly uh, lead to a development where we would uh, uh, surpass 
uh, the thresholds of sustainable use of forests, not only within Europe, but also beyond. Now, this is just, is, so the question is about monitoring. Uh, how are we going to monitor progress towards sustainability? And the suggestion is to concentrate on key indicators uh, such as materials, land, water, and air, measured in material footprint, land footprint, water footprint, and uh, greenhouse gas emissions footprint. Now we, and we can set these into relation to the GDP in order to uh, measure productivities. And all the methods with regard to the material footprint there are already available. Guidelines from Eurostat, OECD, and we have uh, already databases on that. Uh, and these four footprints, and that is important also with regard to the question, do we need many, many indicators? Well, first of all, it depends where on the, uh, at, at which level of the information pyramid we are. So, do it, uh, so scientists need many data and parameters, but these are not necessarily key indicators and headline indicators informing us about the overall performance of our societies. These need to be less in number and need to be easily understandable. Um, and from a scientific point of view, these four footprints determine more than 80% of the variance of all LCA impact categories. So it's important just to uh, concentrate, uh, or it's, we could save a lot of time and money if we concentrate on the measuring of the four footprints. Okay, I will skip that. Now this is just um, uh, the transition cycle which we can go through. We have to monitor the use, we have to set the targets improve our policies and management and learn and evaluate. So this is just the idea that we need to uh, transform to a system which is, which is based on material supply from within by recycling, driven by renewable energies and keeping the remaining inputs and outputs in a safe, in a safe low risk uh, area. Now the strategies are our, our resource efficiency and recycling in industry a steady stock society, meaning an equilibrium between the build-up and the deconstruction of building and infrastructures, a solarized infrastructure taking our surface as an absorption area or reflection in the tropics, and a balanced bioeconomy where we do not uh, use more biomass than could be supplied sustainably by ecosystems. Now this would, uh, would lead a bit for too far. I, 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 uh, it is just an indication that when we have go through the uh, production line uh, of, say, a production of a car, uh, we can uh, uh, change the, the supply routes, we can improve the material efficiency in the manufacturing, we could change substitution effects which often lead to problem uh, shifting, but the product design is the most important one uh, because uh, there are technical extremes which show that we could do with much less material resources in order to provide transport, although this is certainly not, this is the world champion formerly of least uh, energy uh, consumption here of, uh, developed by ETH, but this is certainly not a family car where which you can drive to, to, to holidays. Um, and we can also show to recycle carbon by capturing CO2 by, and, and transforming it to hydrocarbons with renewable energies. So we can save a significant amount of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, put the chemical industry on a carbon recycling path, but we need the renewable energies and there is a trade-off because we need some raw materials, more raw materials, but we can show that there are sensible uh, uh, production routes nevertheless. Okay, conclusion. Improving the knowledge base is key for approaching the SDGs. The core question is how can we sustain production and consumption systems? And the monitoring and controlling of the four footprints across scales is a precondition for enhanced systems-wide resource efficiency. My last slide is about what's going on. Uh, so, uh, we, we, are, we at the International Resource Panel, we are just providing uh, a recent uh, report which I'm coordinating, uh, which is going to propose uh, uh, that we need a development towards an integrated resource assessment protocol um, that uh, we can base on the, uh, on the resource database which have been developed, showing 
data, which I've uh, ex uh, example shown for Germany. Uh, we need to proceed towards uh, an international competence center for sustainable resource management. I'm, and I'm currently in the process of gathering institutions to that, so I'm inviting institutions who have an interest to, to join that network. Um, and finally, uh, we should think about an international convention on sustainable resource management, um, which is currently under consideration. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Stefan, may I also invite you to come to the stage and take a seat. And many, many thanks, Stefan, for your presentation. Very sobering indeed, but uh, not without hope at the end. Uh, uh, yes, I, I, I identify one gentleman at the back of the room. Please formulate your question or, or remark in a, in a very abbreviated manner. Yeah. Uh, Prasal Pradhan, Postdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. I have three remarks or questions. One is like, I was a bit surprised to see this job creation in water infrastructure. For me, like, I find that a bit, yeah, it's not so sound because the logic is not so good because it, that that happens for every infrastructure. There are the core group and then there will be some spillover effect. I think this needs to be reflected in a better way. Second thing would be like about this resource efficiency. I completely agree we need to decouple resource efficiency with GDP, but, but what, what is more needed is decoupling our consumption with GDP or human development or happiness because we are consuming a lot and I think it's good to focus on increasing resource efficiency, but at this stage in this world, we need to focus more on how can we reduce our consumption, reduce our wastage. And for both the speaker, I have one question. Both, both of you emphasize that we need more indicator. We need good indicator. And my question is like, how long we can go searching or developing new indicator? When is the time to do the action, action for sustainability? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, gather a couple of questions or remarks, if they are still. I don't see any. Uh, yes, uh, there are two in the middle. Uh, one, the gentleman with bear, uh, if you would like to come to the mic. And afterwards, the gentleman in the back of the room. Yeah, my name is Lorenzo Benini. I work for the European Environment Agency. And actually, uh, it's a follow-up of the previous intervention and uh, re in relation to resource efficiency, because we know that um, as soon as you go for, for increasing efficiency, you face the issue of, uh, of rebound effect or Jevons paradox, the way you want to call it, which means that in the end you end up in consuming more. So how do you see this uh, possibly addressed? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the last in this round, the gentleman in the back of the room. Uh, I'm sorry, lady. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm awfully sorry. You were just in, in one line for me. Could you come closer to the mic? My name is Rani Saad. I have uh, one small uh, note uh, for the first professor, Ullenbrook. I think maybe I am um, I'm outdated, but last time I, re I read the SDG number six. It was mentioned uh, need, uh, connection percentage of population connected to improved sanitation. I can see, or I can say that a lot of improved sanitation is available, but it's not sustainable sanitation. For example, there are many sanitation solutions that are taking the wastewater away from the people, protecting health, but injecting all the pollution into the groundwater, which is not sustainable. So I think it should be named, uh, since our SDGs, maybe sustainable uh, sanitation uh, option or sanitation solution. Uh, for the second talk, for the sustainable uh, use of resources, and consumption and production, uh, how are you uh, suggesting to monitor on the global scale the migration of resources? Because you, have, you can calculate in Germany how much is of the resource consumption, how much is production, but 
how much the resources are coming from somewhere else. And in the, in the resource migration, for example, in the agricultural crops, there are also migrating nutrients, migrating water, and most, unfortunately, most uh, commonly migrating from poor places to rich places, because that is how the open economy works. So in, in it, it is also interlinked with uh, uh, against poverty, with, uh, with uh, work against poverty, but also it's leading maybe to hunger. So how can you monitor on a global scale from point A to point B this migration of resources? Thank you very much. Thank you much for the very relevant questions. Could I now turn first to you, Stefan? Uh, what is your reaction to some of the questions posed? Well, thank you. Uh, I think I got two questions. First, the, the gentleman from, uh, from PIC. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I was not convincing in the job creation through investments in border. Um, the, the details of the analysis are in the report, but uh, in, in a summary, uh, we, we used available global databases, did several analysis, and, and you know that what came out of it. Um, but the point is very well taken. Other infrastructure investments also lead to job creation. Energy, of course, yeah. And the interesting question is, under given circumstances, what is more efficient? Where do you put your resources? Is it, is it in a better energy infrastructure or better water infrastructure? So, and it's not that the one can do without the other. I think, it, therefore, this question is maybe, uh, you know, we, we, we should lead that we overall like the SDG agenda, it's not a, a piecemeal where you just eat a few of the SDGs. You know, you have to eat the whole menu to, to make, make a difference. And, and therefore, I fully agree that other infrastructure investments also can lead to job creation. But, but I, I think the, the bit novel part of our report last year on water and jobs was that it was the first report ever on global stage that, that really tried to make that link. And uh, I hope the high-level panel members will, will look at this and, and maybe consider that also, that because creating a job is very important. Just one example on, on this, uh, the Syria crisis is, is uh, terrible, led to, to uh, collapse of state and um, mass movement and with a lot of challenges. One of the reasons is the lack of water. Yeah? There was a historic drought between 2006 and 2010. We can clearly show that on a time series analysis of the rainfall. has never been so dry there. That led that 1.5 million farmers couldn't live from farming anymore in Syria. They, they, they were not equipped with the knowledge to, to deal with that, to cope with that situation. So they went to the city centers. And a lot of rural to urban migration usually leads in many countries, not only in Syria, and in Syria they're special with, with many other governance challenges, but that led to social unrest, to informal settlements, to food insecurity, to tension, and then on top of all the other things. So, and then finally to collapse of state. And I'm not saying that was Syria crisis is only about water, but this is one example where a very severe drought can also trigger, trigger migration. Yeah? So not having a job is very critical. And, and quickly on the sanitation question from the lady um, in the back, during the MDG period, if, if I have the numbers correct, some two billion people got access to, to better sanitation. You, you challenge us and say, but is it sustainable? I, I agree. And we shouldn't forget that another 2.4 billion people still need a toilet, you know, need to have access to, to better sanitation. Almost a, million, a billion globally has to practice open defecation. Yeah. Absolutely a shame. So, so there's a lot of unsolved business. And uh, it's, sustainable sanitation is much more than having access to a toilet. It's about the whole management of the, the, the sludge, the faces, the, the whole system with health implications and so on. So, so these are aspects that need to be taken into account when we talk about sustainable sanitation, including resource recovery. And I, and I quickly touched on this uh, speaking about phosphorus. Thank you. Thank you much indeed. So we follow the whole water cycle. Uh, Stefan, your, uh, your take on some of the questions? Yes, thank you very much uh, uh, for those. Uh, regarding rebound, so what is rebound? Uh, uh, rebound effect is understood as, uh, as increased consumption of uh, more uh, efficiently produced goods uh, with the consequence that we have a compensation of the efficiency gains because more of these goods are uh, consumed. Point is that um, uh, by and large uh, we uh, can observe that the, such kind of rebound actually occurs, but not with the consequence that all efficiency gains would be compensated or even overcompensated. Uh, it's always only a portion. And 
uh, we need to consider that there is no alternative. If we realize that we need to change our production and our products and our service provision and consumption in a way to, to use less resources per unit of service consumed, then we, we must become efficient and we want to get the people consume more of the more efficient products. So they need to grow in the consumption of the more resource efficient uh, products and services. There is no way out. As a, as a consequence, there must be a certain amount of rebound, but we will have at the same time also a substitution effect uh, because we substitute the more efficient for the less efficient products. And we need, and we can monitor the overall effect uh, for the overall economy and for Germany and other countries like Japan. We see at least a relative decoupling and not only of the direct material consumption uh, where we have the system boundary at the border, but including also the material footprint, which brings me to the answering this, the last question. Um, the material footprint uh, accounts not only for domestic extraction of raw materials, but considered also considers the imports uh, and, and the indirect raw material requirements uh, associated with the delivery of the imports, and it subtracts the exports, which are including their rucksack flows and indirect footprints. And this is done by multi, on the basis of multi-regional input-output analysis, uh, which can be used to trace back the material flows to the countries uh, of origin. And for Germany, we know that in material terms, it's about a quarter, uh, which is related to the uh, sourcing of that material footprint in other regions of the world. Um, and uh, we know it also in land use terms, so we are net land importers and we know, for instance, that uh, soy, um, soy uh, imports from South America, which uh, provide our craft food, uh, constitute a significant portion of our land footprint uh, for our final consumption. And we can do that also, uh, the, the tracing back for other product groups in order to pinpoint hotspots and then design measures and policies how to improve our resource efficiency in terms of materials, land, water and greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you much indeed. Uh, I'm afraid, that, ladies and gentlemen, I know there were some hands going up, uh, but we are way beyond this time, the time schedule allocated to us. So I would like to thank both uh, our uh, presenters uh, who actually tried and managed uh, to explain to us what does it mean to change the substance of development? What does it change, uh, mean to change the course of development that we'd like to pursue in the, uh, in the years to come? So uh, I'd like to join you to give them a big applaud, thanking them.